Look in your Bibles, if you would, this morning. To Jeremiah chapter 26. While you're turning there, I want to say to our visitors, we're certainly proud to have you in the house of the Lord. May God bless you. Please don't leave here without making contact with Jesus. He come here to meet your needs. Here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 26, I'd like to read a few scriptures and then we'll look down to Jeremiah 23, chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse number 1, read something like this. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak all unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them, Amen. diminish not a word. If so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. I wish we had time to read the whole chapter we want this morning but you got the privilege of doing that later on but I would like to look on down to verse number 8. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking he just doing what the Lord had just told him to do. All that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying, Thou shalt surely die. Look at verse number 20. And there was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shimei, of kerjath Jerem who prophesied against the city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. Look down to verse number 23. And they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim the king who slew him, who slew him with the sword. And cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Turn back with me if you would please to Jeremiah chapter 23. And verse number 28. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 28. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. faithfully. And notice these words, what is the chaff to the wheat? Friends, there's going to be people that goes to heaven in spite of the backslidden estate of this nation. Amen. Somebody going to reach up there. What is the chaff to the wheat? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Therefore, behold, I am, the, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. That, we call it pleasurism. <laughs> behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their... This is a word right here I want you to keep in your memory. By their lies and by their lightness. Church must be more than fun and games. The lightness keeps us from talking about the realities that's really there and the and what's going to happen if you don't make things right with God? Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people. Notice those two words. And all saith the Lord. Father, we bow in your presence this morning. We ask you to please take your words, Lord, and let this be 
spoken in a way that it's understandable and where we get a hold of it, Lord, and we take it home with us. And knowing that it's your mercies and your love that brought us to this place right here to tell us the truth, Lord, where we won't fail you when it comes down to the end of time, that we'll stand the test. Lord, we praise you for that now in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. In my devotions this week, when I got down to this passage of Scripture of Jeremiah 23 and Jeremiah 26, some of these words just seemed like they leaped off the page into my spirit. The ones I want to talk to you about this morning Uh, I want to start with this passage of scripture in Jeremiah chapter 26 and verse number 2. Where he said at the last part of that verse, diminish not a word. There's been such a pull to raise the heaviness, not the lightness, but the heaviness of the gospel up off of people. The real truth about the gospel is if we don't change our way, we don't go to heaven, we do go to hell. That's a word that people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear the fact that Jesus really died an excruciating death on the cross of Calvary. And they really shed innocent blood for your sins in mine. Blood that run plumb down the cross and pulled up on the ground below his stricken body. They don't want to think that Jesus paid the ultimate price, the sinless lamb for our sins in our life. But that's the heaviness of the gospel. The Lord was after these prophets for being light, like it costs nothing. Just trot down to the church house on Sunday morning, run down to the front, shake the preacher's hand, join the church, come in a demon, leave the same way, but you're still going to heaven because the preacher said so. Friends, that is not a true statement. I'm not here to damn you by no means, but I will tell you, if we as, a, as a believers don't live for God, we cannot go to heaven. And so the Lord has called us to a life of not diminishing one word of the gospel. Now I have clear understanding that the Old Testament has been fulfilled through Christ. We still go back to it as a lawgiver and as a teacher and, and as symbol, symbolism, but the New Testament is, is the new covenant where we live this morning. I, I have understanding of that, and we'll look at that in just a few moments. But I was just thinking of some common scriptures that we have among us that we don't want to diminish one word of. How many has ever heard of John 3 and verse number 16? You know what it talks about? And you know why most people know that verse? It's because it talks about the incredible, unbelievable, incompassible love of God the Father and the willingness of God the Son. Would you quote it with me? So love the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you say these words with me now? Diminish not a word. How many would like to take the love of God out of that scripture in John chapter 3, verse number 16? Did you notice that there's not a hand up? And I'm putting mine down too. I'm so thankful that God's love overlooked the stupidity and the ignorance and the lostness of my sins and my way and of your sins and of your way. He loved us. He put his arms around us when we was fighting him off. He still loved us and died in our place. There's other scriptures, especially in in our ranks where we believe in Christ as healing virtue in James chapter 5 verse 14 and 15 it says, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. If they've committed sin, they shall be forgiven in the Lord. He shall raise them up. The next verse says, confess your faults one to another so that you may be healed. How many wants to take out the healing virtue of the Lord? No. Would you say it with me? Diminish not 
a word. Lord, we want you to love us and we want you to be our great healer. We know that the stripes was laid on his back according to Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah 53 was laid on his back for the healing, our healing, the healing. Peter brings that up. He, say, he says, back there, you, you were healed. Or he says, you, you, that you was. Let's see, how, how does it go in Isaiah? Uh, the stripes was laid upon his back for our healing. Peter says, you were healed, which puts it past tense, that it's already available. It's there for our healing. And of course, we want to say, diminish not a word. Give us all the love of God. Give us all the healing virtue. We look at passages like Second or Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. How many wants to take prosperity out of your walk with Christ? Not a hand in the congregation. No, I'm putting mine down too. I'm thankful for everything the Lord has prospered me, whether it's my health and my mentality, able to, to move around, our finances in our marriage and our children and our grandkids, every way the Lord has prospered. I want to say, lift my hand and say, thank you, Jesus, and diminish, would you say it with me? And diminish not a word. This word diminish is incredible. It means to make or to make seem smaller, to lessen, reduce in degree or importance. And we're saying, Lord, don't take nothing out of these promises that you've given us. In Psalms chapter 23, how many has resorted to that old passage of Scripture that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still waters. And that whole chapter has become just a norm for people that's got difficulties and troubles. And how many would say over Psalms 23 and diminish, diminish not a word. Yeah. Woo! We could go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Brother Justin was talking about this, I think, week before last, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How many here wants no time of rejoicing? Oh, no. We love rejoicing. And so what we would say about that scripture is, Diminish not a word. Now, I want to carry you over to a passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians, and I hope you can feel the same way about it. We're getting down to the New Testament now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How many still in the building? Look at verse number 17. How many is wanting to use the word diminish now? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the assemblies of God. Saith the Baptist or the Methodist or the Church of Christ or any other denomination. No, sir. Look at the pull that's put here. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch, touch not. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7 and verse number 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, perfecting, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How many would lift your hand today and say, and Lord, diminish not a word. Diminish not a word. Don't take your love. Don't take your healing. Don't take your prosperity from us. Don't take away from us rejoicing. Why? And don't take away from the church the holiness of the Lord. 
Friends, the Bible says without holiness, there would not be no soul saved. Diminish not a word. Woo! I want to speak to you from this passage of Scripture, these thoughts that we've been looking at out of Jeremiah and also here out of 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. Here in this verse, <clears throat> in verse number 17, he says, come out from among them and notice these two words. Be separate. Lord, diminish not a word. God has not called us to be like the world. There's such a push in our culture today to make the church so worldly that the world can come in and they can't tell the difference. But God's people has been called not, not to be a freak, not to be some super holy, but to be like him. Not, yes, not to be self-righteous, but to live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, don't you diminish one word. Uriah has just died. And the Lord sent Jeremiah right behind him in the same footsteps to the same king, to the same mighty men, to the same priest. And he tells him, you tell the same thing I told Uriah. I know they killed him. I know his blood is shed. I know they throwed him out in the potter's grave. But I'm sending you with the same word and diminish not a word. Don't you make this gospel any lighter. Help me. This gospel is heavy on humanity. It lays in there. It brings conviction. It turns us away from sin. And it brings us to the righteousness of Christ. It can be no game play, friends. This is the reality of the soul either going to heaven or going to hell. And no wonder it leaps off the page and says, and diminish not a word. In Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 10, Nadab and Abihu have been smitten by the fire of the Lord because they got drunk and offered strange fire and the Lord smote them. That's Aaron's, two of Aaron's sons. In verse number 10 it says, the problem was they wouldn't put a difference between what was holy and what was unholy and between what was unclean and what was clean. Friends, our world wants a gray world to live in. They are sick. You can hear me this morning. They're sick of black and white, but that's all Jesus is. He calls it straight across the board. He never colors in the in-between. You're either going to heaven this morning in this building or you're going just as straight to hell as you could ever go. And our heart is not to be hard, but our heart is to bring you to Christ where you know that you're walking for sure beyond any shadow of a doubt in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that not only have you been forgiven, but your walk supplies the truth that what you're saying with your mouth is the same thing. Hallelujah. Nadab and Abihu passed because they didn't understand this. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. In chapter 11 in Leviticus, the Lord is trying to teach the children of Israel the difference between what he wants them to do and not want them to do. And just the ability to say no to the flesh. So he starts with the what they eat. Did you know what we eat affects us? They say what you eat is what you are. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> In chapter 11 of Leviticus, in verse number 3, he says, The beast whatsoever parteth the hoof, and it's cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud. He's telling them what they can eat. He's trying to get them to understand that there's some things you cannot do and be right with God, and there's some things you can do and be right with God. Our world don't want to hear that kind of a heavy message. They like the light stuff that says, just go on and do anything you want to. This is, covers all of that. Woo! How many still in the building? You can't, you can eat anything that's got the hoof parted like the cow or the deer or the elk. Help me? Yeah. Anything that's cloven-footed and cheweth the cud. But you can't eat anything that's not like that, like the camel. 
He called him out in verse number four. He says, the camel is what? Unclean. So is the coney and the hare or the rabbit or the swine. Whoo! How many of you got up and ate bacon this morning? You swine eaters. <laughs> this was Old Testament now. We're in Leviticus. I don't want you to, I don't want you to blunt, jump plumb down. I'd have ate some bacon if I'd have had some this morning myself. <clears throat> In fact, I did eat a little bit of bacon. <clears throat> of the waterfowl, whatsoever hath fins and scales. This is verse number 9 of Leviticus 11. Whatsoever hath fins and scales, that's what you can eat. The rest of it's unclean. Of the fowls, the eagle, the osprey, the, the, the osprey, the vulture, the kite, the raven, the owl, the hawk, the cuckoo. The little owl and the cormorant and the swan, the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork and the heron and the lapwing and the bat. All of those are unclean. You can't have them, but you can eat chicken. <laughs> Woo! Verse number 22. You may eat the locust, the ball locust, the beetle and the grasshopper. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that's what the Lord said. But he said the other thing that's creepy crawlers, you can't eat them. Leave them alone. What's he doing? He's setting up a way for them. He's trying to get them to understand this you can do and this you cannot do. Now in the scriptures in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 4, under the new covenant, the Lord talks about what we eat. 1 Timothy 4, 4. Every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. All of that Old Testament dialogue is lifted up off of us according as to what we can eat. But the gospel of holiness has never changed from the beginning of time. These people had come out of Egypt. They had been servants to the Egyptians for 430 years. He's just trying to get them. All they knew was what they was told. Friends, most of America has never been servants except to sin. And God is trying to pull us up out of that. And that's why he's using these scriptures. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 11, here's some heavy hitting. God's talking to us about the things that he doesn't want us to have in our life. And this is not what we eat physically. Ephesians 5 and verse number 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. This is God reaching out and talking to us. There's stuff out there that does not belong in the spiritual cabinet of God's people. Keep it, stay away from it. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 19, and we'll just look at some of these scriptures right quick. I'll read fast if you'll listen fast. He said you done quit me after the first five minutes. Huh? Well, keep back on. The Lord said, don't diminish a word. Don't leave nothing out. Here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. This is heavy hitters, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, drunkenness. A drunkenness, oh, I'm sorry, and revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I have told you in times past. Listen to this heavy hitting. They that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Friends, that's not the only time it's in your Bible. It's written in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. It's written in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It's written in Colossians. Over and over, the Lord said, if you do this, I don't care if you claim to be a Christian, you can join in every church in Snyder, Texas. They say there's 55. You can join all of them, all of them. Sign the paper. But if you still live like the devil, you're still going to hell. God has called us out of sin and he's called us into righteousness. And what he told the little woman in John chapter 8, he's speaking to this congregation this morning. Go and sin no more and don't diminish a word. Not one word. Yes, there's blood on the table. His, not your righteous. Jesus died for our sins, friends. And I want to tell you, it cost him a great price, but he was willing to pay it to translate us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Hallelujah. And he's saying to us, diminish not 
a word. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 7. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. If you claim to be a Christian, or if you are a Christian, the call of God is to get as far away from sin as you can get and get as close to Jesus as you can get. Let there be that separation. Would you say it with me? Let there be a separation. God's called us to that. And he said, diminish not a word. The second thing out of this passage of scripture I'd like for us to look at, he says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And then he says, touch not the unclean thing. That is powerful. I don't think it would do any discredit to the gospel to say don't be touched by any unclean thing. The stuff that's out there that carries you back into the world system, however frivolous it may seem, if it's getting a hold of you, get away from it. When I come to Jesus, I was so hooked on roping, I would not live for God. I walked away from there, sold my horses. I mean, I, I got plumb out of the system of, of roping for money because I was hooked on it. And I'm a free man this morning by the grace of God because I shut it out. I do have horses now and I, I work and rope, day working and stuff, but it doesn't, no longer does it rule my thought pattern and my want to and my life. I've been ruled by a brand new master and his name is Jesus. And he said for us to come to him and don't touch the stuff that's going to take you down. Get away from it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 3. Genesis 3 and 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye. Did you know stuff is hard to eat if you don't touch it? How many has ever had a peach jump off the tree into your mouth? <laughs> Or you're trotting down through somebody's garden and there's a big old squash there and it just jumps up and gets in your mouth and all of a sudden just goes down somehow. That's the first fried squash you had that wasn't cooked. It don't happen. If you don't touch it, it don't come in. <clears throat> Tobacco, how can it get to you without you using it? Your touch. Yes. You can't even run your TV without touching it. You got stuff on there you can't watch. Don't fool with it. Don't let it touch you. Don't touch it. Diminish not a word. Hang on to what this gospel's saying. If you, if you bit separate, then don't let it touch you. Don't let it come back into your life. But of the fruit of the tree of which is in the midst of the garden, that's the tree that caused the fall. God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Diminish not a word. Isaiah 52 and verse number 11. Isaiah 52 at number 11. We're talking about be separate in this second part of my message is don't touch it. Isaiah 52 and 11 says, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Friends, did you read that early scripture in 2 Corinthians 6 where he said that we are the temple of the Lord. We don't belong to this world and this world does not belong to us. We're headed for another place and another world and another God. Hallelujah. We've left this in the name of Jesus so don't touch it. Don't let it take you down. All the beasts, the fish, the creeping things that are not good for food in Leviticus 11 and 31. Whosoever doeth touch them, when they be dead, shall be unclean until the evening. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Colossians chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Touch not, taste not, handle not. After the commandments and the doctrines of men, there's books you don't need to read. Amen. There's preachers you don't need to hear. 
those books don't represent the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if those men don't represent the preaching of this book, uh, they got to be liars because God cannot be. Don't diminish a word of this gospel. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He said, let every man be a liar, but let my word be the yea and the amen of this gospel. Teach it like it is. Call it straight across the word of this gospel or don't make it so light that it leaves no impression on the hearer. In closing, in this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians 6 and 17 he says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And then he says something that is so powerful. And I will receive you. Friends, if we're willing to come God's way, his arms are wide open. And he will take us like we are. But he won't leave us dirty. He's going to wash us in holy blood. And let us become brand new creatures in him. And walk away revived. And I will receive you. This, this means that he will accept us. And he's saying, don't diminish a word. Friends, you can drag the lowest of the low like we were before salvation right to the throne room of grace. And if they'll repent, man, woman, boy, or girl, Jesus will wash them as white as snow. He is no respecter of person. He's in love with the lost world. And he's bidding them to come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I I will give you rest. That's a promise from the Lord. And when he says here in this passage of scripture, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You can know that his arms is just like this, to be receptive to our needs. Exodus chapter 28, verse 36 and 38. In Exodus chapter 28, Verse 36 and 38, it talks about a, the mitre. It was a little plate that was right on the forehead of the priest on, on the little hat that he wore. And it was tied on there with a blue ribbon. And written, engraved upon that plate was holiness unto the Lord. It was tied with a blue lace to face the front of the mitre. And it shall always be upon his forehead, speaking of Aaron, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Friends, God is asking us to spiritually tie that mitre right there on, on, our, on our spiritual heads. That we, are, we have become something when we come to Christ. We have become holiness unto the Lord. And would you say it with me? Diminish not a word. Don't make it light. Don't make it small. Don't lessen or reduce the degree or the importance of what holiness is about. But wear it on your forehead spiritually and let people look at you and say there's a person that's not just not self-righteous but born again. I can see the very love and the power of God living out in their lives. Acts chapter 10 verse 34 and 35 Acts 10, 34 and 35. This last part of my sermon is, and I will receive you. You, you get separate from sin. Don't touch it. I will receive you. That's the promise of the Lord. Here in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35, Paul is talking to Nicodemus and he tells him, I perceive that God is no respect of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I mean, the door is open. He's reaching out there and saying, you come. I'm willing to receive you. And that's the promise here. I perceive that no, he's no respected persons. Every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9, wherefore we labor, that whether we be present or absent, we may be accepted of him. <clears throat> On judgment day, there'll be no preacher condemned by his parishioners that rose up and preached hell hot and heaven beautiful. And those people look and see that because somebody told me the truth, I made it to the portals of glory. But hell's going to be full of preachers 
and parishioners that heard a light, soft message that never called them to the righteousness of Christ or to the holiness of God Almighty. And friends, when they stand before God and he says, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, there's going to be a scream goes out from the voice of those people that why did you tell me the truth of God? Jesus says, you got one place to go, Jeremiah, and don't you, your life is on the line. I read to you in the eighth verse of the 26th chapter of Jeremiah, where when he got through speaking, they said, this man is worthy of death, and they would have killed him if God hadn't have stood in for him, but he lived out to the end of the book. Woo! By the grace of God. Would you stand with me this morning? You're here today, and it's in your heart the understanding that without holiness, no man shall see God. And you'd be honest enough to say, Pastor, I know in my heart there's some things I need to deal with. And by an uplifted hand, eyes are closed, uplifted hand. Pastor, I want you, I want you to pray for me. Here's hands already going up. Yes, I see you. God bless you. Would there be others? Here's other hands right here. I, I see your hands. God bless you. We're going to be praying this morning. And we're, our prayer is, God, help us to diminish not one word of what this gospel has spoken. But when we stand before God, we'll stand before God right with him. Lord, would you please forgive us where we failed you? And Lord, you look at the many hands that was raised right here in this congregation today over this message about holiness and not making in light one word that you've spoken to us. Lord, where our prayer today as a pastor is that not one of these that's raised their hand, Lord, would come short of meeting you in the portals of glory. And Lord, hearing that well done, thou good and faithful servant, let it happen this morning and we're thanking you for it in the name of Jesus. Would you come? These altars are open.